All right. Hello, everyone. This is Matthew Thibault, and I'm pre-recording my talk in case of technical difficulties, uh, presenting from Hong Kong, and it also to hit my time slot and my allotted time. Uh, I'm talking about the use of Jamie Abersold's play-along materials in prisons, and in particular, something called Jamie's Prison Ministry. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for co uh, questions afterwards, uh, but since I'm pre-recording this, uh, why don't you go ahead and either add them to the chat or um, write them down for after. The study I'm talking about is drawn from a, a much larger study that's going to have several outputs, um, including one uh, article, a history, an overall history of the play-along as mediated improvisation education that's been accepted to the Journal of Research in Music Ed. Uh, should come out next spring, about a year from now. Uh, it's a 24-month study funded by the Education University, 24 interviews, form and oral history, which is triangulated against uh, analyzing a bunch of different documents and uh, secondary sources on the history of jazz education. I observed Abersol teach and others teach at the Summer Jazz Workshop, and I utilized a great research team. Here they are, Sharon, Malo, myself, and Zhang, Today I'm talking about the specific use of the play-along in the prison ministry. You know, what was the ministry? What was its history? Who was involved? How did it function? And what are some of the stories? But let me back up and explain what a play-along is so that you'll know what kind of thing is being used. I did about a four-minute intro. Basically, jazz education came together in the 60s and 70s. It got figured out. Even though jazz education went back to 1900, it really flourished in the 60s and 70s as educators agreed upon and settled upon a set of ideas that, in my phrase, we, jazz became domesticated in exchange for bringing the wildness of improvisation into the curriculum. And that happened around in a couple of different ways. New theoretical ideas were introduced. The chord scale concept was worked out and expanded, uh, which basically says for any given chord, there's a, a scale or scales that one can learn that can help guide improvisation. Um, uh, summer camps, like the Summer Jazz Workshop, became popular. And then the play-along. Here's uh, the first one from 1967. Uh, and the play-along is a multimedia tool for practicing, and it includes... Uh, theoretical ideas and tips, pedagogic suggestions, patterns that you can practice. Um, Abersold had some really interesting theoretical ideas like a, a scale syllabus that presented a bunch of potential substitute scales. And then you needed to work these out. You needed to play a lot. And if you didn't have a jam session, or even if you did, you might prefer to sit at home and practice. And the that's what's really interesting. If you're learning to play classical music, you're learning to play the same tunes over and over in the same way. The jazz musician wants to play tunes differently each time. So this takes, this is a theory tune. It's a 2 5 one. It's just D minor to G7 to C7 major 7. So how does one learn to be creative? Well, they learn patterns that fit and outline the chords, and you learn the scales. And you practice in this context. You play. It's the musical equivalent maybe of a flight simulator, you know? And you explore and you enjoy. So the play-along allowed these theoretical ideas to find a place in the practice habits and in the teaching styles, and it became a shared model. I call it the soloist as such, a shared model of what it would mean to be an improviser. And then the tools that you would use and the ideas that you would apply. So jazz education flourishes around all these amazing volumes that Abersold starts to put out. 
A neighbor Salt becomes financially very well off. Uh, he's able to quit his day job at a flower shop so that he can focus on creating volumes and teaching jazz, which was his dream. He's one of the great educational entrepreneurs. Uh, all of this is told in a particular uh, article that I have coming out next year in JRME. Um, but that's the ground upon which I'm then going to explore how these were used in um, prisons. These tools for learning to improvise, the play along. Thanks. All right. So as I said, I went and watched Abersold teach in 2018. And on the side of the room where he was teaching, he had this little board that said Jamie's Prison Music Ministry, which I had not otherwise ever read about or heard of. And I thought, well, I'd like to learn about that. And it seemed like this technology that I just demonstrated, this play along where you have a record and a book that helps you, I could see that it might be really valuable. And so I asked Abersold how this originated, and it turns out it started right when Volume 1 was published. Well, I had Volume 1. It was out, and a guy, a prisoner in Tennessee, heard about it, and he wrote and asked me if I'd send him a copy, and he said he didn't have any money. Well, my first thought was, well, I wonder what he's in there for. Did he kill people? And blah, blah, blah. Uh, but then I finally said, okay, well, I'll send him a copy, which I did. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning and you also get a sense of Abersold's initial worry about working with people who are in prison for what crimes they did. And uh, that's a, an, a, an opinion that has changed over time, and he's learned a lot more uh, about just treating people as human beings. But he was initially worried about that, you know, and I, I can understand that. I've had a chance to visit a few prisons, and I was nervous the first time. Uh, now, in terms of what the ministry consists of, it's very stable because he's been doing it for decades. He works with a particular shop, a music shop in Indianapolis, to donate instruments when they get asked for. He also mails out play-along volumes to people that write and ask for them. And he will donate audio playback equipment so they can listen to the play-alongs and use them. And that's, uh, been, you know, used to be LP players, turntables, and CD players. You can see in this letter, it's a request. And uh, Abersold said, wrote a note at the top, needs a keyboard. And, uh, and then he says, Doug will send a keyboard used in a new box. Because there's a lot of real strict rules about what kinds of uh, materials can be sent and what condition they need to be in uh, so that people don't smuggle things in, etc. But the ministry, in my examining dozens of letters that were sent to Abersold, was often partly about um, getting materials, but very much also about friendship and connection uh, with people who wanted um, to have someone else in their life. And you can see here, uh, this uh, uh, person wrote uh, that they wanted to say thank you. And at the bottom, it's a true blessing. I can't begin to express the positive impact music has had on my life while incarcerated. Uh, a lot of letters like this, and it really speaks to the importance of Abersold's uh, philanthropy in getting these materials out there. There were also opportunities to advocate uh, because Abersold knows how the levers of power work. You can see here on the left, you know, if you pause it, I'm not going to read them both, but he said, he wrote and said, a friend of mine, uh, has had a stroke and isn't getting the therapy he needs. And he was uh, being uh, incarcerated in a private prison. And on the right, you can see um, the commissioner of the state of Indiana Department of Corrections wrote a letter that was CC'd to Abersold to be sent to the prison to say this person needs to receive that therapy. And he was able to intercede on people's behalf uh, in, a, in a really powerful and productive way. Uh, and it, it also, he connected with specific programs, um, and that is what got me in touch with Charles Musgrave and the Indiana Maximum Security Prison. Charles uh, ran what I believe to be the only college-level music program uh, from 1974 to 1996 at the Indiana Maximum Security Prison, where they administer the death penalty, and they had music for a long, long time. This photo is not dated. But Charles uh, had it, and he shared it with me, I'm guessing the 1940s. Brass band and string band, although I don't know if they played together, but they posed together. And here's Charles. Jamie learned about his program from this newspaper article back uh, in the 70s. 
And on the right-hand side, you can see Charles now. Uh, he was outside playing taps in uh, memory of people who have passed during COVID, and he sent me that photo during our correspondence. And he sent me a lot of other beautiful pictures. Um, and we spoke at length, and I'm not going uh, to get into all the ins and outs of his life, but Charles was trained as a classical French horn player and could not improvise, but most of his musicians wanted to improvise. So he reached out to Jamie because he had heard about these materials and said, can I get them? And uh, Charles ran a concert band, but he also um, supported his uh, students in forming rock bands, country bands, R&B bands, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one of the, the central aspects of this prison was that several times a year there would be visits for... Um, performances. So the bands would perform and you each inmate could invite uh, a family member or a girlfriend. And so the musicians were held in high esteem. The concerts they gave were loved in part because the, the people who were there got to bring family in. Uh, and uh, music was a really central part. Let's listen to Charles for a minute. You would give preference to those people who had a life sentence because you'd have more time to work with them. Yeah, for two reasons. One is I had more time to work with them, but the second reason was they knew they were going to spend, for the most part, the rest of their life there, and so they wanted the environment to be as calm and cool and collected as they could possibly make it. They were a lot more settled. They were a lot easier to work with, and what a personality that could be violent and awful on the outside became somebody that was very stable and and I'm talking for the most part. That's the ones that I chose. So there's Charles talking about that. And he spoke also a lot about uh, rehabilitation. And uh, this is another uh, quote or recording of Charles during our interview. As hard as I worked to build something that was fulfilling, made people into humans mm -hmm. from their various i never knew what they had done i didn't want to know unless they would come and confide in me and tell me what they did i i never wanted to know that i only only wanted to bring out the good that was in them mm. and they found out they could i've got one of my former inmates right now that's a street musician in seattle that I'm still in contact with. I'm in contact with several of them, but he plays outside the ballparks and the basketball, you know, where they have their, their professional sports in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I never tried to make a professional musician out of any of them. You can hear kind of a pulling back and forth of classic in a music teacher that he wasn't trying to make a professional, but he also couldn't resist telling me about one of his students who had really made it who had worked as a professional musician, and that, uh, of course, I wanted to reach out to that person. That person's Proctor Prim. I got him on the phone. Uh, Hello. Hello. Is this uh, Proctor? It is. How you doing? This is Matt from uh, Hong Kong Hi, calling. Did I, did I catch you at an okay yeah. time? No, you actually called me at a, at a good time. <laughs> And I spoke with Proctor several times, and then we've had several email messages. Uh, and he told me a little bit about how he got started with Charles. I had heard about the program when I was in jail, and I, I really didn't want to go to the reformatory, the reform, the, the Indiana Youth Reformatory, because it was kind of it was kind of a rough place, you know. Right. And. Uh, uh, I'd also I'd like to say I heard about the educational program there at the at the at the state prison, and so I uh, I uh, kind of insisted that that I'd be sent there to do my time, and it, it it was worked out, you know, for me to go there as opposed to the to the reformatory. And uh, people who were playing in Charles's program, which was college level, needed to have a GED. And so Charles accepted him conditionally and said, you've got to get that GED within your first year, which Proctor didn't have any, any trouble doing. Uh, 
Uh, and I, I really like that photograph um, taken while he was there at, at the maximum security prison. Uh, but he came in as a clarinetist because he'd played clarinet in elementary school and he had never improvised and he wanted to. And so I asked how that came about. And he had a mentor named Crump. Uh, again, the gentleman, uh, my, my mentor, Crump, he had bought one of Jamie's first book, the uh, volume one, mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, jazz improvisation book. And, uh, <clears throat> um, he was, we would practice out of the book every, you know, every day. And, and, and what Proctor told me was that, uh, they used the books formally in the program, but they also just had them in their cells. Um, Crump had a turntable and when Crump was released, he let Proctor keep the turntable and they had the records. And he said, you know, the guys who were into weightlifting, weightlifted every day. The people who were into basketball played basketball every day. We played music all the time, every day. They would go out in the yard, they'd bring their horns, they'd be in the cells, they'd play. And they used play-alongs to learn to improvise and to have fun. And uh, it really was a fantastic part of his life. And he spoke very movingly. Uh, well, give it a listen yourself. You know, I... It's in a in a weird kind of way. Having gone to prison was a good thing for me. Mm-hmm. I, I I think I I think I came out a much better person. Well, I know I did. I came out a much better person than I was before I went in. I have a greater understanding of life worth, and 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 where where I fit in this universe, and. Uh, Really, it's you know the music. The music has kept me. Has, has the music has fed me. The music has clothed me. The music has kept me. It has kept me in automobiles in order to be able to go play the music. You mm-hmm. know, I have an eleven year old daughter now. It you know, and that so sounds great. It it, it 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 sustains me, and so had it had it not been for for Musgrave and and Jamie Abersall, then and my life still having taken the same path without that. Yeah. Then yeah. I I, I <laughs> So uh, it was really r- remarkable to me the degree to which music allowed prison to be transformative and rehabilitative for Proctor. Uh, and for 12 years, he was in touch with Jamie. They ended up corresponding, writing back and forth, and Jamie uh, attended uh, Proctor's parole hearing and testified on his behalf, and Jamie told me that when they finished, he asked the judge, can I go over and shake Proctor's hand, and it's the first time they met in person, 12 years after they first got in touch. Um, And Charles also, of course, working within Indiana Maximum Security Prison, uh, had this experience that so many of the people that he worked with experienced this rehabilitative side. I'll let him say it. Out of the hundreds of men that I worked with in those 22 years, I only had three return to prison. That's remarkable. I, I think it is. It's, it's a story that needs to be told that music does change people's lives. And it's a real pleasure to get uh, to tell that story and to try in this article that I'm revising uh, something about uh, Jamie's prison ministry and and the interconnections that the play along made possible between uh, people like Jamie and Proctor. But it's also remarkable uh, that someone like Proctor could come out of prison and in uh, decades since make a living as a musician busking. Uh, And so I want to close by honoring that journey by sharing uh, about a minute of Proctor on the streets of Seattle. Uh, if you're ever visiting, I hope you uh, say hi if you see him, because he's still there now working.
let me sum up briefly before we have our discussion to say, uh, in, in the article, in the discussion, I make the, the case that um, largely this is a story about relationships and how important they were uh, in this prison music ministry. Friends, mentors, teachers, in many cases lasting decades. Um, I also think it's interesting when we look at uh, technology and media like the play along that it has a social nature. It can be distributed across time and space, but these play alongs, which seem so individualistic, are uh, often used to connect people to ideas, to help them to learn, and then to lead to real in person concerts and performances and friendships and connections. And I think understanding that better is helpful. Uh, I think that music. Anytime we can speak about how powerful that is in carceral settings in terms of rehabilitation, we should do so. We need to advocate for that. Uh, it's very moving to get to hear these stories and to find out how valuable music was. And it's not that hard to include it um, in people's growth, in people's learning. Um, and then uh, the rehabilitative nature of music uh, even the vocational side. So uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. I look forward to our conversation, some questions, and our discussion of this. And uh, I'll be sharing this paper through publication somewhere sometime. And uh, I look forward to that also. Thanks again. <laughs>